Good morning. This is Brett Godfrey with the second edition of my podcast, Viewpoint. We'll be having guests in the future, but today I'm just going to speak to you about a subject I get a lot of questions on, and that is, what have I learned about problem solving in my 33 years as a professional trial lawyer or in my military flight experience or skydiving experience or chemical engineering before that? My whole life has been about problems. My whole life has been a long series of problems. And that sounds tawdry. It sounds depressing, like maybe I just want to go climb into a bottle somewhere. But in reality, solving problems is what life is all about. So I'd like to tell you a bit about my philosophy on problem solving, because I do it for a living. People come to me every day with legal problems that seem intractable, unsolvable, and we solve them. So how do we go about that? I'm not going to give you a lecture on the law. I'm not going to give you a lecture on how to be a trial lawyer. I have a separate video series where I do just that. But I would like to just talk to you everyday people about what it means to solve a problem. You could sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and make a list of all your problems in life. You could easily pick one problem and say, I'm going to work this problem until I solve it. But notice my words, work the problem. I've studied so many different methodologies from uh, what are uh, considered advanced special operations mindset to uh, problem solving at a philosophical level. I've studied everything from Scientology to sex to safeguarding technology. And I can tell you that in the, in the context of these things, there are common universal principles. And if you apply these principles, remember these principles, and then, and then apply them, you will find that almost any problem can be solved. So let's first of all start by talking about a problem that can't be solved. What's a good example? In the immortal words of Socrates, I drank what? There is a problem there. Socrates was forced to drink hemlock and that, that was execution style uh, end of his life. So what, what was his problem? Well, he wanted to live, but he had to drink hemlock. He had to die. That's a problem that did not have a solution, all humor aside. So there are bad things that happen to any person in the course of their lifetime, but not all of those things are avoidable. It is a natural fact of life that bad things will happen to you. So problems associated with a fear of an unavoidable negative outcome are the worst and the hardest things to to deal with because you can't solve every problem. A negative outcome, a bad thing that's coming down the pike at you, you may or may not be able to do anything about it. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is, Is there anything I can do to prevent this bad outcome that's threatening me? Maybe if a person is diagnosed with terminal cancer, they face their end of their days, we're all going to die eventually. Every single person that ever lived on this planet died. So uh, we have the ones that haven't died yet. That's the population of the world. But it is a fact that not every negative event can be avoided. But let's talk about the daily problems that are not the end of the world coming because of a cancer diagnosis or a criminal execution or something along those lines. Let's go the other end of the spectrum now, and let's talk about a a typical problem that every American has probably faced at one time or another, which is what to do when you don't have enough money to pay the bills. What do you do if you want to get into college and maybe you don't have the grades to get into college? Those are problems. So if you think about those everyday types of problems, they have a basic anatomy to them, an objective and a barrier. More than one objective, more than one barrier, or one objective and lots of barriers. But that's one definition of a problem, a desired outcome and then something that gets in the way of that. How do you solve those types of problems? Well, generally, it's, a, it's an engineering question. You have to engineer a solution. So I can give you a good example. Uh, this, I run, as I sit here now doing this 
Viewpoint podcast. I'm sitting in my law office in uh, Denver, Colorado, and I used to own two office buildings. I had the one that I'm sitting in now and one next door. I had cash flow problems for a while because my law firm uh, was managed by someone other than me for a period of time, and that person wasn't able to run the place skillfully enough to keep it in the black. So we were losing money every month. I, I didn't have enough money to pay all the firm's bills. I didn't have uh, enough money to pay my own living expenses. Uh, I had to delve deeply into my sales, excuse me, my savings just to keep my law firm running. That's a problem. There's a goal, which is to have a profitable organization that runs in the black where there's more profit than loss. And there's the, uh, the intervening, intervening obstacle or barrier that creates the problem. I can't. Why not? Well, this is the first real key. Get the correct reason to the question, what is causing this problem? If you identify the barrier and you miss on that and you attack a barrier that isn't the barrier that's causing the problem, you can work very hard, not solve the problem even though you remove that barrier because it wasn't the right barrier. You have to identify the cause of the barrier. And this is systematic thinking. So I always recommend to people that they take a legal tablet or a piece of paper or an iPad and they write at the top, what is an exact statement of this problem? And I don't care if your problem is bills and not enough cash flow, or maybe you are in a troubled relationship and you're not sure whether you should stay in it or get out of it, or maybe the person that you're in a relationship with isn't being faithful to you. Uh, these are all basic problems. And that doesn't mean they're not painful. It doesn't mean they don't keep you up at night, but they all have a common anatomy, which is objective and an intervening barrier. You want your spouse to be faithful to you. Spouse doesn't want to be faithful to you. So the barrier is the spouse's decision-making and the spouse's behavior pattern doesn't fit your desires. So how would you solve that problem? Well, you could realize one day that just good communication could patch that relationship up. You could have a opposite realization that says, get out of the relationship. But it still persists. It hangs. The problem doesn't go away. It lasts for days, weeks, months, years, perhaps. It just doesn't solve itself. Why not? What will it take to solve that kind of a problem? Uh, talking about you know a successful or unsuccessful relationship with someone in your life. The answer is a decision must be made. And the decision could be, I want to be in this relationship, but it's never going to be what I want it to be. So what do I do? I change my objectives. I make a decision or I decide to put up with it. And once I accept it and truly wrap my mind around the fact that I've accepted it, I've made a decision by doing that. But it, it's a decision that will solve many problems. It may be a decision to abandon the objective and the problem goes away. But many of us have this not being a quitter priority in our mind. So we don't give up. We don't quit. So we have to solve the problem a different way than just giving up. Giving up is a an effective way to solve problems. It doesn't get you where you want to be a lot of times, but it will make the problem go away. And it's just interesting to contemplate that philosophically for a while. What that means is the power of a decision in the face of a problem after you understand the nature of the problem. So if Sally is in a relationship with Bobby and Bobby's cheating on Sally, and Sally knows it, she's got a problem. She could decide to ditch Bobby. She could decide to put up with it. Or she could decide to lay down an ultimatum on Bobby and say, one more time, we're done. Uh, any of those are decisions, and they tend to put us on a path of forward motion towards the direction of a solution. But if Sally wanted to use, and I'm using a, a super simple example here, to give you the basics of the anatomy. Start simple and then get more complicated. Sally could take a piece of paper and write down, what is my problem? She's asking herself that question. And she'd state the problem. And then she might look at it and say, is that really the problem? You know, Bobby isn't faithful to me. That's my problem. Well, not so much. That's a cause of difficulty in her life 
It's a cause of disappointment. It's a cause of, of stress, of negative emotions. But that's not the anatomy of the problem. If she were going to do this the way I suggest, she'd say, goal, have a relationship that is monogamous with Bobby. Barrier. Bobby has a tendency to want to have other relationships on the side. So I want Bobby to be faithful. Bobby doesn't want to be faithful. That's a more accurate statement of the problem. Because then she has to understand what are the factors that go into the problem. The anatomy is her desire and Bobby's refusal to cooperate. But the factors that you have to list and think about in a problem is why. And remember, I said answering the question accurately why you have a problem is absolutely vital to solving a problem. So why do I have this problem? Well, it's Bobby's nature. You know, he's got a wandering eye uh, or he's a ladies' man or whatever. That's a factor. But the why comes from the collision of the barrier with the desired outcome. So think about that for a minute. The collision between the desired outcome and the barrier. Give you an example. Sally goes to the grocery store one day and strikes up a conversation with someone in the store and there's instant chemistry. Suddenly, Bobby's not such a big issue anymore because her objective will change. She found a new man. And by changing the objective, the problem goes away. She didn't give up. She upgraded. Maybe she found a better guy. So it's the collision between the objective and the barrier. That's where the problem lives. And what creates the stress in a problem is the emotional fallout of that collision between the objective and the and the. Uh, and the barrier, when those things collide and they bump into each other, uh, that creates a, a, an emotional reaction in people. It may be, oh, we're not going to get the project done on time. Pro big projects due on March 30th, and we're running out of time, and you start to realize there's no way we're going to be able to solve this because at the rate we're going, we'll never have the project done by March 30th. What do you do about that? Well, you could say, how far can I get by March 30th? Will that be at least a compromise that's successful at some degree? Or you could say, we need to move faster. How do we do that? How do we engineer it so that we make 10 times more progress in a day than we've been making? Factors. You say, what's slowing production? What's slowing our work? Now, here's another kind of problem. And this, this is good to look at in the immediate aftermath of the basic anatomy of a problem that I just described. And that is, I can't figure out a solution. Why does that happen? How does it happen to you? I can tell you that running a law firm, I have younger lawyers come in with legal problems they can't solve. They come into my office and sit down with me and they'll say, well, well here's my problem, boss. I, I want to do this. I have that issue. I have these conflicting objectives or lack of knowledge about what will produce a, a satisfactory outcome instead of a disaster outcome. And when they come into my office with those types of problems, I always say the same thing. I can't solve your problem. You have not given me enough data. And I write down, I say, I, give, I just take a sheet of paper and I write it down and I hand it to them. Here's the data you did not give me, which is why I can't solve your problem. Now, you go get that data, I will solve your problem. Then they take that list of unknown variables that have to be filled in, possibly through legal research, possibly through talking to experts, possibly through just finding out more about the facts of a case. Whatever it may be that was missing, they go out and they get that, and then they laugh because they no longer need my brilliant wisdom to solve their problem for them. They went and got the missing data. And from that, they could solve their own problem. And it happens almost well over 90% of the time. I don't want to say quite 100% of the time. But when I tell them, here's what you're missing, they go get more information. So two things that make a problem hang other than just the hesitation to make a decision are lack of data or incorrect data. Lack of information, incorrect information. So we have a failure to make a decision. We have a lack of information. 
we have incorrect information. Now we've got three of the basic classifications of what causes a problem. Now, if we go back to my example with Sally and her frustration with her unfaithful boyfriend, she may need more information on that. What more information would she want? Well, Bobby, why do you cheat on me? It may be that Bobby is living up to a genetically programmed impulse, which is called libido, and he just feels this evolutionary need to plant his seed as many places as he can because that's built into the male psyche for a lot of people. Um, And I know there's a lot of uh, frowning going on at your end right now. Depending on who you are, you may say, well, that's not funny and you know, whatever, but it's, it's a fact of life that people do things that cause other people pain. Some people enjoy causing pain. Maybe Bobby likes to see Sally tortured by his infidelities. Maybe that flares his ego up. Maybe it's not that he's horny. Maybe it's that he likes the ego stimulation of knowing he can have more than one woman. Maybe he has a sadistic pleasure response from making Sally suffer by being aware of his infidelities. If she could find out what his drive is, if she could find out what's pushing him to do this type of behavior, then a solution might make itself visible. Maybe that information won't help, but it might. So the point is, you keep getting more and more and more information until suddenly you have enough. And the solution at that point it's, it's almost magical, it tends to jump out at you. Well, here's the solution. Maybe she finds out that Bobby is a sadist. Maybe he's a, uh, a type of person that likes to just cause pain. Finding that out makes the decision easy to make because unless she uh, is a person that likes to be abused or cheated on, which might be in her nature, and she, she has to explore her own self and say, is part of the problem in me? By being unwilling to cut the tie here and say, I'm going to go on with my life and find another man. The problem originates with the desire, but the barrier may be coming from a location or source other than what seems obvious on the surface. So really finding out what's happening. Lawyer comes into my office and says, I have a legal issue. I don't know how to solve it. We have computer-aided legal research in our firm like most, and I'll say, go do the research. You don't know enough about the law. And they read and they dig and they dig, and then they find a source of legal authority that that supports their position. So by learning more about the law, learning more about the facts of the case, learning more about why the boyfriend cheats, learning more about how to make more money. Uh, And there are podcasts all over the internet on how to make more money. I know a a brilliant uh, marketer by the name of James Harper who runs a company called Agency Flare, and he provides information to people. He shows them tools that work. Somebody wants to make more money, they uh, want their startup to be successful, he'll say, okay, here's what you're not doing. Here's what you don't know. So fill that knowledge void and also police the integrity of the data that you rely on. Always check your premises. Now, that statement, check your premises, was a statement made by Ann Rand back in the, uh, in the 50s. And she was the founder of the objectivist school of thought. She wrote the book Atlas Shrugged. She wrote the book The Fountainhead and several others, uh, We the Living. But her attitude was check your premises, which means I start with a premise, which is a foundation of the existence of a fact. The foundation of the existence of a fact. What does that word foundation mean? It means where did this information come from? Check your premises. Make sure the data you're working with in your mind is true and accurate. Then make sure it's complete by getting more and more and more until the solution jumps out at you. So I've given you three tools now. One is... Make a decision unless you want the problem to persist. Another one is understand the the actual nature of the 
of the collision between the objective and the barrier and what it does to you mentally, psychologically, or emotionally. Third thing is check the validity of your data and get enough of it to solve the problem. Now, let's talk about a different kind of problem. Let's talk about the type of problem that you would have if you have more work to do in a day than you can get done. And by falling behind on deadlines, your stress level rises. Now, this is important to understand. A rising stress level is not the same thing as the existence of a problem. Mounting problems that add and add and add and grow in number without going away creates a situation in life that you feel you can't get out of. But all those problems are individuals. Every problem has to be solved on its own. You may come up with solutions that solve multiple problems at once. Those are beautiful uh, cognitions or realizations that, that we can have. But the aha moment that comes to solve one problem, whether it solves another or not, shouldn't be the issue. You take your problems one at a time. You write them out. What is the actual problem? Get all angles of it. List the factors of that problem. Get more information. Make sure your information is correct. Always be wary of your assumptions. We make assumptions that turn out to be false without checking the accuracy of the assumption. And we find out that we've been working with a deck of, of joker cards instead of a full deck because the assumptions were wrong and we never went back and verified them. So always be willing to go back to square one, verify your assumptions. That's part and party to do, making sure your data is correct. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the mindset of the problem solver. We've all heard the saying by John F. Kennedy, uh, some men look at a situation and ask why. Others look at things that never were and ask why not. That's a synopsis of the statement. But I can tell you there's a mental tone level that you have to be alert to. If you're down in the dumps, if you have expectations of negative outcomes with maybe no basis, then your, your mental power, your horsepower, the amount of, of creation or creativity that you can pour into a situation will be lower. You have to sort of have a devil-may-care attitude to solve a problem. You have to get up outside of the problem so that you can look down onto it from above instead of from within it. I have a little model I keep on my desk. I'll be right back. But I, I keep this on my desk because it reminds me of the truth of this. I have a little world inside a glass ball. And I look down in that little world and I see a continent. And on that continent, I see a city. And then I see a fleck of light and I decide that's where my house is. And I imagine that that house is about to fall down from disrepair. And then I think about how stressed I would be if I was in that house. But I can pull myself up and out of it by saying, wait a minute, I'm here in my office in a different world looking down into this world. So the ability to elevate yourself mentally to an altitude above the level of the problem itself so that you can look down on it from an external viewpoint and I can see the problem from more than one angle. If I'm playing chess, I like to be able to mentally turn the board 180 degrees so I know what my opponent is probably thinking and looking at. If I can see that chess board from my opponent's eyes and my opponent's point of view, as well as my eyes and my point of view, that's, that's we, I have heard that called pan-determinism, where you can see things from multiple angles. Being able to do that is more a mental exercise and it's more a, a product of mindfulness than most people realize. You have to say to yourself, well, what if I wasn't me? What if I was outside myself? What if I was somebody else looking in on this problem from that angle, from that viewpoint, from that, uh, from that post? How would this problem look? And it'll look very different. So get distance is the fourth tool. Get distance from your problem and be able to see it from multiple angles 
See it from the front, see it from the back, see it from the side, philosophically speaking. Change your viewpoint. That's the fourth tool. If you have been keeping track of these four tools, as I've tried to explain them to you, you could sort of say, all right, let's try each one of these four tools on a problem. First thing that comes to mind, write it down, get the anatomy of the problem, get the objective, get the barrier, list the factors, and try these things. See if that doesn't make that problem go away. Then pick a new problem. Then pick a new problem and do it from an elevated mental place. And when you start to do this repetitively, you will see that problems are the source of the game of life. Without problems, life would be deadly dull. And solving problems is thrilling. You get into the mode of believing in yourself, knowing that you can solve problems. And suddenly, you'll be looking for problems to solve. I need more problems. I don't have enough problems. I hope this helps. And this has been episode two of Viewpoint. Thank you for listening.